You're listening to the Hawk Media Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and executives crush the digital marketing game. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Sophia Amoroso. How are you doing? Hi, good. How are you? Good, good. Good to have you. So, you know, always like to start with the beginning. So like, did you come out of the womb, just a girl boss ready to take over the world or like, where did it start? Take me back to childhood. (laughs) I came out of the womb, like a really kind of misunderstood, angry, young girl who never really fit in. So like from kindergarten, first grade, like was already angry, didn't fit in. That's misunderstood. Um, yeah, I was a challenging kid. I, um, uh, I mean, I don't know. One of my first memories is punching my friend in the stomach because she dropped my play doh, I mean, and I thought she threw it on the gr- I sh- thought she threw it on the ground. <laughs> um, Where do you think that? I actually from? wasn't like I didn't like. That was like the one time I ever like hit somebody. I, I wasn't like a bully and I wasn't like violent and I didn't like really punch people, but I like kind of can't believe I did that. <laughs> um, How old were you? I mean, probably like five yeah. or something. Yeah. Just like, didn't that's like what people did on TV or something like yeah. hey, self-defense or just reenactment of what you think like being a human is it's pretty yeah. much what and- you're doing at that age. And so where do you think all, not that specific situation, but like that uh, misunderstood side came from? Like, were your parents a little shy, less social? Or like, where, where did you think that derived from? I'm just, I'm an only child and I think I'm really weird. And I think my parents expected a much more conventional child. And I think <laughs> like- They always do. <laughs> it took a little more like kind of decoding maybe to figure it out. Nobody really quite did it. And I'm still trying to do it, but- um, I definitely wasn't, I just wasn't the kind of kid that you could read, like, you know, what to expect after you've had your kid or, you know, you're no longer expecting or whatever and learn how to raise. Um, I was just like a really willful child. Um, but I don't think there's anyone to blame. I, you know, I'm, I'm a Greek, Italian and Portuguese mm-hmm. and the Italian side of my family is pretty mean. <laughs> um, so there's certainly some like, kind of like hereditary, probably like, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've struggled with depression and anxiety, but I'm sure that that's like something that's gone undiagnosed for like, you know, eons in our lineage. Um, so there's certainly some of that just kind of like coming out of the womb, like a slightly angry, like part Italian girl. I think that's yeah. part of it. Yeah. I, I don't want to butcher it, but I think that has to do with epigenetics and like what you can inherit from your parents. That's not necessarily always straight genetics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sense. yeah. Um, and okay. So, and what did your parents do? Like, what were you, what was kind of the environment growing up? Yeah. So I was born in San Diego mm-hmm. uh, and lived there till I was about seven. Um, we lived in like three different houses for whatever reason. We en- ended up buying one. And then it, I think it got too expensive. So then we moved to Sacramento, but I moved to, uh, I was born in San Diego. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, mom didn't work for the first, I think like year or two of my life, maybe honestly, I don't remember. I think she only breastfed for like three months, yep. which I kind of, or maybe less, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, I think I resent her for that, but I don't remember exactly how much time she did yeah. breastfeed me for, but like, um, enough to feel like rejected or something, but, um, dad did home loans. So dad, okay. yeah. So mostly new homes. Um, so there were, you know, there's always homes being built. And so when we moved to Sacramento, there was even more of that. So yep. San Diego till I was seven, uh, moved to, to Sacramento and then was there all the way through high school. And then I moved out before high school ended. Um, but yeah, only child. It's like hard to go through my entire childhood. Like I don't really. Oh know yeah, you're it. good. I'm curious. It, only a few things, and I want to get the career side too. But uh, where did you have an entrepreneurial side as a kid? Yeah. So as a kid, I was. I had books. I mean, this was the time of. Um, I mean, it was like the early, early Mac computers. My grandparents yeah. had like the little boxy one where you could like yeah. actually print something, and it looked like a ransom note. 
<laughs> you know? um, and I had books called like odd jobs for kids that had like a, like a poster that you could like blow up and like fill in your services and your phone number. Oh, that's you know? awesome. Cause you couldn't yeah. really like make that stuff on the internet. And it was like dog walking or like babysitting or like, yeah. um, and I remember like tinkering with that stuff. Um, I had a, um, I had a paper route for a little while. Okay. In Sacramento. <laughs> Born in the 1930s. Um, in Sa- yeah, in, in our like suburb and like my dad drove around and I like hung out the back and it was like this Thursday special, you know, it wasn't yeah. like the main newspaper. It was like this like extra thing that like came and you yeah. find in your driveway and like don't want. Um, <laughs> so that was fun. I don't remember ever making any money. And then, um, there was a lot of like, you know, like sales on the sidewalk of little things like yeah. my own stuff or I'd like bake stuff, but it wasn't like a, I just, it wasn't like, yay, I'm going to play with my dolls and then I'm going to go do a bake sale. It was like, I don't know. I just, it, it was, um, it felt like actually kind of entrepreneurial and, yeah. um, and I'm trying to think of what else there were lemonade stands. There were Girl Scout cookies. Mm-hmm. Um, there was babysitting at one point. And so, yes, yeah. yeah, always doing something kind of thing. And all right, so you go through high school. Did you go to college or what did you do when you moved out and finished high school? No, I absolutely hated high school. I mean, I went no. through, I went to like, I don't know how many different schools. I went to um, Montessori of some kind in San Diego for half of kindergarten. The other half of kindergarten was at Fair Oaks Elementary. I was there between kindergarten and second grade. So that's two schools. Third, uh, third grade, I went to a rapid learner program, uh, which was totally weird at Detterding Elementary. The teacher was awful. My mom pulled me out of that. Wow. Um, and I took full advantage of like how much they treated us like adults. I would just go like <laughs> chill. Like I would go, yeah. like, we need you to do this to go to the bathroom and yeah. during class. And like, you could just like leave during class and I just go like hang out in the bathroom for like an hour. <laughs> So that's three schools. And then fourth and fifth grade I actually went to Catholic school until they didn't properly kick me out, but my parents also couldn't afford it anymore. Sixth grade, I went to public school and met a bunch of like in the night. It was the first time I'd kind of been in public school with the kids like in my town for the first time because rapid learner program was like in another town. This other stuff we had lived somewhere else. Um, so that's sixth grade. And then seventh and eighth grade, you get poured into this middle school, which is another school, um, with kids from the local public school and all the other local public schools. Yeah. That like all know each other and all been friends since they were kids. I'm like, I haven't been friends with any of these people since I was a kid. That was kind of tough. And then I guess there's high school, but I technically went to two high schools because I homeschooled for half of high school. Yeah. So I went to eight schools. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and I didn't go to college, but I, I homeschooled uh, for the second half of high school because I absolutely hated it. I um, I was still angry. I was um, an anarchist, and I went to Marx a Marxist study group and uh, the anarchist book fair, and I was sure that school was uh, a way for the man to kind of beat young people into submission so that they would just sit at a desk for, you know, 40 hours a week and collect a paycheck. And I thought that was uh, child abuse and yeah. that like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like super well researched on science, but it's like very Pavlovian to like raise someone to hear a bell and move to a different room. Yep. Like I'm not going to I was gonna say, I, I know there was a high school view of yours, but I think there's validity to it in some sense. Yeah, yeah totally. Like yeah. I still agree. Just like I'm, I'm like in my prime and you have me sitting at a desk for this many, many hours a day. I can't eat when I'm hungry. Yeah. Like I have to like ask, I've like ask to eat food. Like this yeah. is dehumanizing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like I just remember being like, I'm by, vi- I'm being violated with these rules <laughs> in middle school. Um, I, and this is the kind of thing I would do, I was hungry. So I just like started eating and then I just had an apple and I started eating my apple in the middle of class and you're not supposed to eat in class, but I was hungry. So I was going to eat my apple. And the teacher said, Sophia, stop eating that apple, throw it away right now. 
And so I got up um, and very slowly perf and performatively walked to the trash can while like eating like the whole thing, like the yeah. core, you know, all the way to the core, just like, <laughs> like all the way to the trash can. And then it was like, bink into the trash can. Like, well, I finished my apple. <laughs> like it was that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, so I homeschooled the second half and I got my uh, diploma, I guess, in the mail. So it was kind of like yeah. a COVID graduation. I didn't like yeah. graduate with anybody. I didn't go on a trip. I'm not really friends with anybody from high school. And then um, I did get a little bit of community college after that, but moved out at 17. Mm -hmm. Now I can just keep, I guess I, now I'm on a roll. The go. early childhood stuff is like the confusing part because I'm like, I don't know. I think I blocked that all out. Oh, no, and I like it. Yeah. So when you graduated and you, you move out at 17, which is young. And so and you just went on on your own. What what did you do to like, what was the, how'd you make money to pay the bills? Yeah. Like, what you yeah. So um, my parents were getting divorced when I was 17 and I'm an only child. And it was like this pretty strict household um, where finally they were like so busy with their own problems that I could just kind of like go do what I wanted. Yep. Um, and so I, you know, my mom had moved out, my, you know, dad was still in our house and I moved to downtown Sacramento into a closet, um, with a bunch of like dudes who were musicians who had like already lived there and like their name was on the lease. There was just a closet off the living room that was actually oh. under the stairs that was like this wide. So you would have the Harry Potter experience. $60 oh. a month. Yes. Yeah. $60 a month. It's like, why even bother? Yeah. Um, and we had one of those like you know, day beds with like the pull out trundle bed underneath. And it had this like really crappy little piece of foam, slick before memory foam yeah. that I pulled out and it was like yellow um, and um, put it in my little um, closet. But it was so, the closet was so narrow that it curved up on the ends, yeah. that twin size little thingy. And I painted the walls a really pretty, like, I mean, it was like a dollar's worth of paint yeah. and I found like a carpet remnant and I like cut the carpet remnant to like fit my like weird shaped little like closet. Um, and that was where I lived for, I don't know. I mean, it was probably like six or eight months. And then, and it was right around the time that these guys got evicted that I decided to move to Olympia, Washington. So they stopped like paying their bills and we eventually had like our refrigerator. It was one of those like motel style apartment buildings that are like two levels. Yeah. Um, Very and, like movie-esque. Like, yeah, outdoor. like the outdoor. Yeah. Like, it's like an outdoor hallway on the second level. Um, yeah. You walk up like concrete, like, you know, 1950s. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Cantilevered <laughs> stairs. And so we pull, we, um, I not we, but they took an extension cord from the, from the uh, kitchen, from the refrigerator down to the laundry, the like communal um, laundry room of the building. And that's how our fridge stayed on um, and eventually got kicked out. Yeah. Um, I remember like I accidentally put like dishwasher, dish, like normal dish soap in the washing machine or in the dishwasher. Yeah. And it like, turned into like a bubble yeah. party, like a, like a foam rave or whatever. Yeah. And, um, I was like, well, I guess I'll just mop the floors. And so I mopped the floors and realized they were like a completely, they were not like dark colored. Like I thought like they were like actually a different, yeah. they were actually like light colored. They were just yeah. dirty. The fraternity house experience, but not. Kinda, on the yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got it. And so you, what took you to Washington? How'd that happen? Yeah, I um, I really wanted to go to this school. I didn't really want to go to college, but um, when I had done all my research on schools, I wanted to go to kind of like an interdisciplinary school. And initially it was like Reed College, and I really wish I had gone to fucking Reed College. You know Reed? Yeah. It's like, it's like a really cool liberal arts school that's in Oregon. Mm -hmm. I think who went there? I don't know, like Steve Jobs or someone so insane. Um, it's just a very like small group learning interdisciplinary literal, liberal arts school. Um, but it's actually kind of academic. I wanted to go to the Evergreen State College, which is in Olympia, Washington, which is a state school that doesn't. So it's like not expensive. That doesn't require 
uh, that doesn't require a, um, what's it called when you pick a focus? A major. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't go to college. Um, no, I know that. Uh, like it, you, you can like make up your own major and there's no yeah. like general oh. ed. You just like yeah. go to school for four years and like learn, you know, it's kind of like, I'm a wildflower. I'm going to learn underwater basket weaving and, you know, chaos theory or something yeah. like how those two things, like the intersection of like, you know, Madonna and it, what, I don't know. Um, that, that movie accepted. If you've seen that. Uh uh-uh. Oh, you got to see it with Justin Long, I think is his name. Oh, really? Blake Lively's okay. in it too. Yeah, it's literally like a bunch of kids create their own college. Yeah, it's basically like that. It's like Lord of the Flies. And Sounds so awesome. I moved up there to Olympia, Washington, which is also this place that um, it's kind of like a hotbed of like very like super liberal kind of activity. <laughs> like I was still like a, a, an anarchist. I was like an angry teenager who like didn't want to work and thought that capitalism was evil, which maybe, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. It works out sometimes. But um, there was like a community of, of people there who um, were kind of like in, in that like ilk. And uh, it also had like kind of a long history of like music um, like good bands coming out of Olympia. And so I knew, I just kind of, it was like this little place where I like knew like one person, I think. And then there was a college I could go to. And nope. it was just this very like hippie, super hippie place. I remember I could go on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop telling so many stories. No, I like, this is um, great. <laughs> I remember one time I was kind of dating. I was like 19 or something. I was like 18. I was like 18. I was like kind of dating this guy, but like, I didn't even know what that was. Like I didn't have sex. So I was like 19, but I was like hanging out with this guy um, who was like, of course, everyone was older than me. Um, and he lived on this commune um, or I'm sorry, intentional community. Um, <laughs> they corrected you when you were up there. I take it. I probably. <laughs> and um, he lived in a tree house like literally a tree was running through it and he had like somehow like, I think I like a little hot plate up there. He didn't have any like run. Did he have water? I don't remember if he had water, but I know that he, there was like a tiny little balcony and he peed into a sink on the balcony that had a hose attached to the bottom to it that went down and watered a fern. And one day I went in to, um, the, that house, the main house, and there was like his like lot mates or roommates or co livers, <laughs> I don't know what you call them, were um like naked and they had like a deer, like they're like skinning a deer and like there was like blood everywhere. And I was like <laughs> a kid and I was like, what's going on? And these people were like vegan mostly, you know? Like yeah. And they were like, it's roadkill. We can't waste it. Like it's, and it was like all spiritual. It was like, make use of the dead deer. And I was just like, this is so fucking weird. Um, and eventually he's just, he didn't like stop hanging out with me. He just started hanging out with someone else who would sleep with him. And then it was like, Hey kid, <laughs> ah. <laughs> it was kind of like what happened. It was just like, yeah. wait, where did they go? And it's like, yeah, think? I feel like that. Yeah, the, the, those free spirits, there isn't anything really defined. They just kind of go with the flow. I yeah, grew up in totally. Ohio and went to a total totally. so, um, Definitely have that in my background as well. Rude awakening. Yeah. Um, and so, how long were you up there for? How long did you live in Olympia? Um, lived in Olympia for like eight months, maybe. And then I moved okay. to Seattle. Uh huh. Um, and I lived up there for a year to get residency so I could go to school for cheap, uh-huh. pay in-state tuition. Yep. And by the time I got residency, I was like, this school's bullshit. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I had kind of outgrown Olympian and kind of outgrown Seattle and moved down to San Francisco. Yep. Um, and, and what, what attracted you to San Francisco? I'm from Northern California. So my family was really close. Um, I have friends, I have friends there. Um, it's a beautiful city. Yeah. 
um, I went to, I wanted to go to San Francisco City College, which I did. And so that was, I guess, the first time I kind of started doing community college and yeah. I was taking photo classes at San Francisco City College. Um, and did you have an, did you want to be a photographer or what was? I did. did. Yeah, that was the whole thing. And it was around that time that I um, really started taking, like taking photography seriously um, and put together a portfolio and applied to the San Francisco Art Institute in North Beach and um, CCA um, in, well, there's, it's in San Francisco and Oakland. And those are like two of like the top art schools in the country. And I got into both, but they were 50 grand a year. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't go. Um, but that was kind of, that was the path I was on. Um, mm -hmm. And so I decided to take community college classes instead until I kind of, you know, went through the, continued the litany of crappy jobs. Into and we have, what, what were some of the jobs you were doing? Um, I mean, first job in high school was Subway. Um, mm -hmm. But everything from uh, Borders Books to, you know, a diner to a dry cleaners, rubbing, um, ring around the collar off of men's shirts. I was like a teenager. I didn't know that happened. But yeah, of course, you're going to get like, yeah, like filth here. Mm -hmm. So like rubbing that off and like separating white shirts by starch level for like $6 and 25 cents an hour. <laughs> and like, I mean, I think about some of the stuff and I'm like, where were my parents? Um, <laughs> in um, San Francisco, I worked at a photo lab, which I loved. And I, I eventually lived in Portland too. And then back to San Francisco. So in Portland, I worked at a photo lab. I was also a stripper in Portland. Um, I also got arrested in Portland. When we, uh, you moved to Portland after San Francisco? Yeah, yeah. It went Olympia, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, yeah. San Francisco, Nasty Gal. So I had done a whole lot of stuff before I was 22 and started yeah. Nasty Gal. So got it. Yeah. So up to Portland, you said, what were the th job stripper or something else? <laughs> um, <laughs> Did I actually work? I worked at a gift shop in Portland. Okay. And I was a stripper and I stole stuff. You stole stuff. Got it. And that was when you were what, 21? Uh, no, I was like, I like used someone else's ID to work in like a bar. <laughs> like Got it. Stripping. <laughs> like, um, I was like maybe 20. Got it. 20. And then you said back to San Francisco after that? Then back to San Francisco. I know this is so confusing. And I'm um, curious, like, what was taking you back and forth in all these places? Yeah, what it was, was it was either money or like, um, like unhappiness or something, like depression. Mm -hmm. Thinking initially, it was I'm going to find my tribe. Which, yeah, uh, yeah. Like my people are in Portland, so I'm yeah. going to go there. And then, yeah, got it. I mean, that's what people. Anyway, I'm gonna we're gonna edit this. Initially, <laughs> it was because you don't say tribe. Um, initially it was like, I'm going to find my people, you know, there's yeah. people like me somewhere. I know I don't fit in, but they've got to be in Olympia. There's so many independent thinkers. Yeah. I was like, well, no, um, there's great people, Seattle, same. No. Yeah. And then by the time I got to San Francisco, um, I, I got a boyfriend and then my parents were like, okay, you're going to move in with him. Like, we're not like, they had kind of like 19, what, you know, they had helped me a little bit. Um, and they were like, sorry, like, we're not going to help you anymore. And I, it was just too expensive to live in San Francisco. So I moved to Oakland, tried to get a job out there, too expensive to live there. And so that dude and I moved to Portland together. And, um, and I was there for like a year, maybe. Um, and that was like, pro that was like a, a dark year. It was like a very dark year. He was an alcoholic fry cook. His name was Wade. Alcoholic fried cook named Wade. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. And so I get take it. You just went, this isn't what I wanted and move and decided to move back down. I kind of had to. Yeah. There was this crescendo um, of, okay. Like I'm like, just things aren't aligning. So I really was still at that stage in my life before I was like, okay, I need to like really play my cards, right. Play by the rules, work hard, like do all the things that will like bring good karma. Don't try to take shortcuts. You know, I was just like shortcuts. Like I can 
I can subsist on shortcuts and used clothing. Um, I eventually got, I did get arrested in Portland for, for stealing um, a whole shopping cart full of shit um, from a Fred Meyer, which is kind of like a Target, Walmart yeah. type of place. You just loaded up the cart and walked out? Yeah, that's what I did. Like, I was like very, I'd done this so many times. That's what I was going to ask. Like, it wasn't the first time that you got yeah, caught. Yeah, you like right? don't get caught if you don't conceal things. Right. Well, but but it's thing went off like I didn't pick one of the sensors off of something <laughs> um and so I had a huge shopping cart I had a George Foreman grill tampons whole wheat bread um uh like a basketball it was a soccer ball but like basically walked out of the store secret shopper came and approached me in the parking lot whatever um I wound up with a court date and it turned out that that court date fell on the day uh, I had to terminate a pregnancy at the sliding scale women's clinic. And that was, I had to have the sliding scale women's clinic send a note to the court for my shoplifting date about why I couldn't make it. Yeah. And it was just like, seriously, like, I'm like, this isn't like, I'm like, this isn't me. Like, how did this happen? Like, this isn't, this isn't my life. Like no. I don't act, I'm a fucking prude. Like I'm a problem child and I, you know, I'm entitled and I, you know, all kinds of things. I don't like accidentally get pregnant. Like what the fuck? No. Um, and then, and that on the same day, and it was just like things that something's like really wrong. And so it was like, I, this is sorry, Wade, <laughs> <laughs> you know, after a little while, it was just kind of like, I don't think, I don't think Portland's for me. And, you know, I don't think you're for me and moved down to San Francisco and, and stopped fucking around. Got it. And so is that right when you like moved down to San Francisco and started trying to figure things out, so to speak? Yeah, I started taking. Um, yeah, it was, um, was that before or after. Anyway, um, I had a job at a shoe store and I worked in the lobby of an art school. And those were the kind of the two jobs I had before I started an ebay store um, and that's how nasty girl started was ebay yeah so tell me about that like were you just you know i've heard anecdotes and stories but were you just finding used clothes and putting it up on ebay was basically the gist yeah um so i was sitting in the lobby at an art school you know in san francisco i didn't end up going to one i worked at one i was getting friend requests on myspace this is 2006 no. from ebay sellers who were promoting their stuff on uh, MySpace and had like accounts for their, you know, similar to like what Facebook pages are, but there weren't pages. It was just like an yep. account. Yep. Um, and they were like adding friends of people they thought, you know, might be interested in their stuff. And apparently I was one of them. Mm -hmm. I, um, and I clicked through to see, and I wore pretty much only vintage clothing. So they found the right person, but I'm like not someone who's going to like pay retail prices for vintage clothing. Like I didn't understand. I just, I didn't yep. know that they sold for that much money. Like yep. I knew to find vintage, I could find it, you know, even on hate street, which is like, they already have markups. I thought yep. that was expensive. Like the stuff on eBay was really expensive and it wasn't these sellers saying like, my stuff's worth $200. It was them putting it up for a nine ninety nine starting auction price and people in, you know, the Netherlands, Australia, and like New York city fighting over it. And one, all it takes is one girl to be like, this is worth $300. And yeah. All of a sudden, this thing you bought for like, you know, eight bucks is worth $300 on eBay. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that, this is crazy. I know where to find this stuff. I have an internet connection. Um, basically, I left that, you know, the last job was in the lobby of that art school and yeah. put a few things on eBay. None of them sold. <laughs> Not for nine ninety nine. Yeah. Um, and just like kept trying and kept tweaking stuff and seeing what other people were doing and stalking them and tweaked my styling and tweaked my descriptions. And that yeah. was, that was the beginning of it was, um, yeah, it all began in a lobby. Wow. And so how long did it take you to start like making money on eBay? Like how did, how long did it take that kick off? Um, I mean, maybe like a couple months or something. I mean, uh -huh. making okay, money, it's like me. making money is like something sold. Yeah. You no, know, not like I invested 10 grand and I finally made a return. Like there was no real investment. It was yeah. 
you know, some of my used clothing and a few other people, you know, then eventually I started kind of curating stuff, mm -hmm. but not long. I mean, that's the beauty of selling online. I mean, What's interesting though, is I, I could also see though in two months, if you're putting stuff up and it's not selling, like a lot of people would give up in two months, even though it doesn't feel long. Like that's, you know, 60 days of being like, you know, is it going to go? Like, do I have to change yeah. stuff? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I know I've sold a few things in that period, but it wasn't no. like, oh, wow, this is what I'm doing. It was like, oh, let's see if I can like make a few extra bucks. Not like if I can like, you know, eventually build a big business. It wasn't, it wasn't yeah. anything like that. And when did you name it Nasty Gal on eBay right away? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about naming it I Heart Vintage. Yeah. And it would have been pretty forgettable. And I just yeah. wonder how different my life would be if I had named it I Heart Vintage, like such a different yeah. time. Um, and that was like, stuff was named that. It was like the time of like Steve Aoki and like, yeah. you know, Cobra Snake. And like, I don't know if you remember, how old are you? Yeah, I'm 34. I'm not that much younger. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I Heart Vintage didn't sound as, as lame as it sounds now. <laughs> um, but yeah, Nasty Gal from from the beginning and uh and so how long till it started like really like picking up steam that you're like whoa this is kind of crazy did it take a lot of time like did it was it the like you know five-year overnight success or was it really bad? um it was pretty quickly you know once i started selling stuff then it was like i learned really quickly and i was very responsive and i didn't have inventory of stuff that like wouldn't work you know it was like yeah. okay this is working i'll go find more stuff like that oh that person sold I could see people's closed auctions and how crazy their last, you know, 10 seconds went when their, you know, auction was closed and what yeah. people were um, going crazy for. And I would go find things like that. And yeah. I figured out like, oh, like, what's the designer this is referencing like that? Like what designers like ripping off this piece of vintage? Like what words can I use to describe this that will elevate it? Like. Yeah what is Sienna Miller wearing like a poncho in like a boho way with tall brown boots and the Olsen twins are doing some other shit at the time. Like, okay, how are they looking? What are the pop art? Okay, great. They look like this. They're styling it like that. This is what people want. Okay. And yeah. then, yeah, people will pay like 300 bucks for a, you know, vintage like knit poncho because it looks like, something that came down a runway that's like three thousand dollars if you style yeah. it like if you put it in the context of culture or fashion or whatever it is that um you know that person wants to participate in but can't necessarily um it makes it way sexier and that was a huge huge part of the 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 speed of of how things grew so i mean year one was 75 grand which to me was like so much money yeah i mean i was 22 it actually kind of is yeah, yeah. Um, good money yeah um and then the next year was 250 grand and sure. that was i had left ebay like halfway through that year i think and launched my website and then the year after that then out was like no ebay uh at all like still selling vintage but really scaling with new products started going to trade shows uh -huh. that was 1.1 million and then the next year was six and a half and the next year was 28. And so that was from like wow. 22 to, and that was bootstrapped, no investors, no right. debt. Like, I still don't know how, <laughs> how somebody yeah. did that. I still that don't that know. is a huge ramp without any outside capital. That's it's, impressive. I just still don't know. And, and you know what it was? I didn't understand. And this is probably why things like, you know, could have gone better when things got to scale. Mm -hmm. I like, I didn't, forecast I was it was very I was I was like feeling it I felt my business and I was like well we sold out of that really quickly I'll go buy 40 of that dress instead yep. of 15 this time and sell through and then I was able to work like in a very kind of like iterative yep. quick way and replenish the product without over investing in anything mm -hmm. um and my idea of business was really simple sell things for more than you pay for for them and don't spend all the money. That's it. Yep. Just like, yep. don't like the overhead was super low compared to, you know, where the company was going. I personally didn't want shit. Yep. You know, I didn't know, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I didn't, you know, it was like the most exciting purchase of my life is probably still the 2000, 
nine Nissan Murano that I bought um, and like put like half down on and, you know, um, used. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's, that's, it's pretty crazy. When yeah. I you weren't, you weren't doing it for the flash of like, I need to get a, I'm going to buy a Ferrari or a beautiful house or anything like that. It was like, no, I'm just, so I am curious though. Did you have like, I mean, that's, you were doing it like five years when you hit 28 million. Is that right? Um, 28 was in like 2012. So five, four, I started in first full year was Oh seven, yes. eight, nine, 10, 11. So six. Six years. So, um, and during that time, like, did you have a vision of like, I want to build this big thing or is it just like, Oh, they're still buying it. So I'll just keep going and let's iterate. And like, it was more just heads down, not like a bigger, greater vision of it. It was very heads down and there was no bigger, greater vision. Yeah. And that's, um, and that it was, it was, it's, it was a reactive business for me, yeah. you know, which is great. Like that's yeah. how you, you react, you iterate, you, you know, evolve, but at the same time, there was no like top down or top yeah. down kind of like view of the future for the business. Mm-hmm. And that's when, uh, you know, it was at $28 million and in, in run rate when investors came in and were like, this is insane. Like you're profitable. I owned a hundred percent of the company. Like they, you know, plowed $50 million in at a $350 million dollar post yeah on that note why yeah. take money at that point is it just like you've never heard you can't believe they were doing it or um i the company didn't need it you know yeah. i I, right. I had one and kind of advisor mentor his name's dana freed and he's really really great um and he was like because these people had, investors had crawled out of the woodwork and been like hey we've seen what you're doing let's talk and i was like i don't even know who these people are yeah um he was like, just wait as long as you can before you ever like sell part of your company because you'll sell it for some, you'll own so much more of it. Yep. And I didn't need to, um, which is probably why, when you should raise. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I didn't ra- raise, it makes it sound like it was like proactive, you know, it was like Jeff Jordan from Andreessen flew down, fab.com was like the hot thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed flew down. He had, you know, Bonobos, I think was just happening. Um, and then um, Danny Reimer from Index, I met him and he mm-hmm. said, you have a community, I get it. And and it was like, this is 2012. And he looked at like the obsession uh, of our customers and said, you have a community. And I said, okay, like you understand this. And, mm-hmm. you know, to own 80% of my company, control the board, and uh, take some secondary and plow, you know, tens of millions of dollars into your business yeah. to supercharge it. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah. Um, and in some ways it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, yeah, tell me about, I mean, and I know we only have about 15 more minutes, but uh, tell me about like what happened after that. How did things change? What, what was there? Was there a shift? I and mean, obviously you had a bunch of cash, so you could do whatever you wanted, but did you become more grander vision at that point? Or were you still like, oh, I have this cash now. I'm still heads down, but. Can do um, you know, to raise money without a plan is a really dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. And we still didn't have a plan because they sought us out. And yeah. I had never put together a presentation when I sat in front of the partnership at Index. I'd never made a PowerPoint of it or a deck of any kind. I'd never walked through a presentation. I'd never given one, nothing. I, you know, I didn't go to college. Like I didn't have a job in an office until my name was on the lease of one. They wanted to invest um, enough to where they had their associate put a deck together, like asked me and like, you know, I had a couple executives at the time, like asked some questions about the business and like, Um, put all of that into a deck and literally kind of like prop me up and said, like, read through this and like answer, answer these questions. So it was really naive of me. And it was really, I think, irresponsible of them. Um, And yeah, we put our finger in the air and we said, okay, well, we went from 1.1 to six and a half to 28. So we were on our way to, I think we were even just on our way to 28 when they valued the company at 350 million, by the way. Yeah. Um, and said, well, let's round up by a hundred million. We'll go from 28 to 128. Okay. So 2013, we're going to do 128 million. Go let's hire. 
Yeah. And that's what we did. And mm-hmm. we signed, you know, 40,000 square feet of office space. We opened a fulfillment center in Kentucky, like massive, you know, hired, you know, executives from Zappos and a CTO and a, you know, CFO and a, another COO. And mm-hmm. uh, I had Tom Cruise's ex-assistant and like, it just became like, it was like, that was my first assistant who actually had experience being assistant. I had like someone who was pretty much an intern before that. It was just like, it was such a shock to the system for me as like an entrepreneur for the company, like financially for the team to, to like hire like a hundred people in a year, which people do somehow successfully or seemingly yeah. all the time. Um, it was, um, it was, it was, it was a blast. <laughs> it was a total blast, but it was, uh, it was a recipe for a mess. And so what, yeah, where did it end up going? It, it, did you how, like, and I know obviously the outcome of the company, but like what, how long did it take to start to like feel a little unstable because of that rapid growth? Yeah. Um, let's see, 2012, 20, probably 2014, probably two years. It was right yeah. after I wrote Girl Boss. It was the uh-huh. year I wrote Girl Boss, the fall of 2014, um, that we had our first round of layoffs. So we did eventually get to over a hundred million in revenue. It just took us longer than we anticipated. We, we did two years instead of one. I think we went from 28 to like 60 and then it might've been 60 to 80 to a hundred or six and then or 60 to a hundred, but it was like no more than like, to, Which, by the way, in normal reality, it's a really good growth rate. <laughs> it was, it, I guess it just cost too much. Like our costs yeah. got too high. We hired too many people or, yeah. I mean, our acquisition costs weren't crazy. It wasn't anything yeah. like that. Um, it just like, I like, anyway, we, our growth, it wasn't, we hired into, you know, we were still growing great, right. but we just hired into the like quicker growth than we had anticipated. Yeah. Um, Oops. And okay. then it was, um, I mean, it was, it was just this kind of like, it was, it was a ride, you know, cause it was still just like hitting milestones and a hundred million in revenue and opening two stores and, um, launching our own line and, you know, all the press and then girl boss, the book put me on this whole other kind of yeah. weird trip. And then the team kind of resented that, I think, but I think it might've sold clothes, but we're not sure. And, yeah. Um, it was just a very, very blurry time. Um, and ultimately, um, I just lost that kind of my, my in, intuitive or just like, I couldn't feel the business at all anymore. And mm-hmm. because I had never learned the finances early on because I had just done it responsibly yeah. and like, didn't necessarily need to look at cash flow Cause I just like knew I wasn't gonna blow too much money. And I knew yeah. how much my overhead was. There weren't a ton of variable expenses. Um, by the time I needed to learn that to really like manage it and hold some like a financial person accountable, it was so complex. Like it was just like yeah. I don't have to read this. Like what am I? I'm supposed to make. I'm supposed to learn how to read this and then make decisions to like right size a company. So yeah. it was a lot of, um, you know, I brought executives in with, um, you know, that that round of funding, who had careers for longer than I had been alive. Yeah. Like, literally they had been like in their jobs, like their expertise is like, as long as like I've been expertise, like being human <laughs> and, and they came in and again, I'd never been managed outside of like a shoe store or a photo lab, had no idea how to lead or manage people. And these are like grown ups, you know, these yeah. people are, like in their forties, which is like, doesn't even seem that old anymore, but like, they had so much experience and I thought they would come in and diagnose the company and like, you know, orchestrate what needed to be done to like plan for growth or install the right, you know, software system or an ERP system or, you know, lead teams or plan inventory or manage finances and cash flow and um, implement whatever. Everything was like an implementation. I just feel like everything was (laughs) implementation. I don't think that happens anymore. I think there's like software that you can like turn on and it like talks to other software in commerce now. Like Shopify didn't exist. Magento was like the hot thing. Yeah. Which, was Um, you know, hit or miss. Back in the day, it was, it took a full dev team to even have a fashion. Yeah. We had a whole engineering team. We had a PMO team. We had a product team. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I didn't hold these people accountable because I thought, okay, well, you're a grown up. You say, you do what you say you're going to do, right? I show up, I do my job. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Like nobody's telling me to do it. Nobody's checking in with me to make sure that I do. I do what the company needs. Right. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a founder. I didn't think that that was unique. Yeah. And um, it's not completely unique, but people do want to be observed. They want to be guided. Doesn't matter how senior they are. Great. You know, I if they said this will be done in three months, I didn't write it down and say this will be done in three. I didn't have. I didn't like have like a project manager working for me. I was three months later to be like, Hey, did that like get done? And be like, well, this happened and that happened. Yeah. And like, Wait, but like the deadline already passed. I didn't check in with you. It's like, ultimately like that's on me. I didn't know any of these things. So yep. there's that. Um, and then I think like a big, you know, I built a crappy culture. I had no idea what I was doing. Again, never worked in an office, mm -hmm. um, started, it's as serendipitous as it is to bootstrap a company from eBay to 28 million in revenue and then take $50 million in venture capital and be like, fucking, you know, darling of whatever I, I don't know. Um, it starting without a plan is not a good idea. <laughs> it's cute. Yep. It's a cute story. Oh, dropout, whatever. It's a, I'm an outlier in that regard. It was a fucking mess. Um, yeah. and I wish I had worked in an office. I wish I had experience. I wish I could have empathized with my team as a leader and a manager, or even understood what management fucking looked like. Yeah. Like, did I wish then? No. So I don't want to say wished in past tense. I wish now because I didn't know the difference then until the culture turned sour. Yeah. Um, because I didn't just didn't know any better. Um, and a big part of, I think ultimately nasty gal filed for chapter 11 at the end of 2016. It's no secret. Mm -hmm. I still think about that. I'm like, how did that happen? Why didn't I just restructure? Like what? Yeah. It was 10 years. And I was also like, I kind of want out of here, man. Like yeah. 22 to 32. Like this is my whole fucking life. I don't want to, I already founded this company once. Like that yeah, really to start all over with it. Yeah. I want to start over. So, um, we raised it 350 post, even when we were doing a hundred million in revenue to get a tech multiple, at that time and direct to consumer, the yeah. direct consumer world, you know, it was like Warby Parker, Bonobos. It was like still this weird, there was no way or Glossier or Outdoor Voices or, you know, Harry's, maybe Harry's had begun, but um, fashion, it was just like, it was retail. And so at that scale, it became a private equity like play. It yeah. was something where our multiple would have been a retail multiple, which is like yeah. maybe one and, you know, one and a half, two times, two and yeah. a half times revenue, which would have valued the company at 200, 250 million. Yeah. Um, that wasn't enough for my investor. So right. in some ways, um, my ability to fund the company at a, in a, in a down round in any significant way, um, was completely cock blocked. Yeah. Um, and that starved us of cash. Yep. And until the very end where everybody realized, oh, wow, we really need cash. And it was just like we were in a worse position. Um, an urban clothing retailer offered over $400 million for the business at one point. And my investor said, like, no, like, we need to ask for more. And it went away. It was on paper. I owned 80% yes. of the business. It was on paper. Um, so... I didn't realize they could block. If it's, an, I guess they can have some sort of preferred return. But still, they, I mean, yeah. That. Yeah, they had they had a yeah they had like a two x if it was under a five hundred it, it was I don't remember yeah. but they had a preference yeah no I've seen that we 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 had a deal like that recently where we we had an offer to sell and one of the other investors blocked it and then the company went bankrupt and it was like <laughs> we would have he all been so like I controlled the board I had two seats and he had one and that was the whole board and I voted yeah. for the empty one next to me. Yeah, there's no voting. I just took everybody's advice because I was right. in way over my head, and yeah. everyone's like, "This is going to be a billion dollar business, and we're going to IPO it." I was like, "All right." Yeah, no, and it's yeah for funds they don't really get to celebrate unless it is a 10x or something like that, and if not, they might as well. I'm go just for a markup. It. I'm just yeah. a markup. Yep. No, it's it's an issue with that whole world. So, uh, um, with the last couple minutes, uh, so you went and did Girl Boss. I know that COVID stifled that a little bit because you're doing a lot of live events, and now you're watching your own namesake. Yeah. Uh, so, other, right? 
launched business class, which is my online course, uh, in September of last year, moved on really quickly from girl boss because our ability to do brand partnerships and events just kind of crumbled and girl boss is still going, but just doesn't really need me. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of like a little bit done being the girl boss, uh, mm-hmm. for now. Um, and just want to teach, like, it's still mostly women, but everybody, like everything that I've learned in 15 years of like the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, I'm really focused on entrepreneurs who are bootstrapping. Yeah. Um, I do a little bit of angel investing, but generally like 99% of businesses, almost every business on Shopify is probably one that shouldn't take venture capital, but you can build an awesome business. Yep. You can make a lot of money. You can have an awesome life. You can even sell your business, but yeah. you don't necessarily need to take capital to do that. Agreed. Um, and so it, you know, I take people, it's a 10 week program. It's really, really comprehensive, like borderline overwhelmingly comprehensive. <laughs> you get lifetime access, but over 10 weeks, I guide you through the content. So it's pre-recorded content and there's 300 pages of worksheets and, and we go through everything from mapping your competition to, um, you know, crafting your elevated pitch. So it's business class, but it's all airline puns, which is really fun. Mm-hmm. And identifying your perfect passenger to creating a brand to digital marketing to, you know, there's a whole, you know, bonus just on PR and pitching yourself all the way through leadership, um, customer experience, like the whole gamut of really thinking about your brand. And it's, it's for commerce, you know, based businesses, but also for service providers. Yep. Um, so it works for, for both. And there's a community that we have called, of course, the lounge. Um, that is exclusive to students and they're able to go through the content together and interact with one another and work through their issues together, which really kind of normalizes how kind of challenging entrepreneurship is Mm -hmm. um, and puts the students in a place where they're not necessarily, they're not just not spinning their wheels. They're in a place where other people are coming with their issues and questions and wins they're able to kind of have that mirror of other people who are in a similar place to where they are um, on their journey as a founder and get support in a way that's really hard to find. Yeah. It sounds like, frankly, you're giving the world what you wish you had while you're going nasty. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. Um, So last two questions. I know we're at the end of time here. First, what's next? What do you kind of see in your future? Is it really focusing on this or do you have some other big things you're working on business class. Yeah. I don't want to do too many things. I want to be really good right. at one thing. Yeah. And I, you know, we launch again on March 24th. Um, so those 10 weeks, I'll be really engaged guiding that cohort of students through the program. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll do it again in the fall. We launch it twice a year. I'll probably take a month off in the summertime. Nice. Uh, maybe travel will be possible at yeah. some point. Any, any place you want to go? I mean, if anything, I would go back to Bhutan because it's the most magical place. I've heard in the that's world. on the list. Yeah. It's, if you go one place, go to Bhutan and stay at the six yeah. senses. Stay at the six senses. If it's the last like 30 grand you spend in your life, like yeah. do that. It's fucking expensive. Yeah. But it's, I mean, um, I think Japan. Yeah, Japan's amazing too. I yeah, would. I haven't been there since I was a teenager. Um, and I did not appreciate it. I was like an exchange student kind yeah. of thing. I got, Beautiful. Like, oh, mm-hmm. okay. uh, Last question to you, because I promised your assistant I'd let you go. Um, what's one piece of advice for people that are just starting to pursue their dreams that are trying to get started out? Like one thing that you don't think they hear every day. So it's not like work hard, but like what would be something you would want to give advice wise? Don't work with friends. <laughs> Do you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't work really, with I've had the same experience. Uh, thankfully, in the beginning, it doesn't scale well. Tons yeah. of like, resentment can happen. If you have to yeah. part ways, you lose your friend for life. Yeah, really, really hard. And it's hard to hold them accountable, which you have to with people you work with. So. And then there's assumptions about them being special and have, you know, yep. exemptions among a team, even if you don't give them exemptions. Yep. Uh-oh, my psychiatrist is calling me. There you go. Well, thank you so okay. much for being on thank Hawk you. Media. We'll talk soon. Okay, sounds good. You've been listening to the Hawk Media Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.